So what do you say to the girl or guy sitting in this audience that has got a bit of a predisposition to want to be liked by many or most? If you don't get over that, you're doomed. Because what happens is this. You start to create a whole bunch of people that aren't even yourself. You never figure out who you are. You, you never live up to your dreams, your ambition. You live up to what whoever is around you that you like so much that you want to emulate and be like so much. You live their dreams. You lose your power. You, you lose your power. The ultimate power is owning yourself. I had to reinvent a human being. I sat at home so, for so many fucking nights by myself, broken, broken, not just physically, mentally, spiritually. But then I sat back and said to myself, I invented a motherfucker. I actually sat back when I was fat, nasty, out of shape, miserable, and created a human being in my mind that didn't even exist and said, that's what I want to be. I want to be that guy. I want to be a guy that's capable of doing exactly what I'm doing today. And you have to, if you weren't born that guy, that mentally strong guy, he can be made. Woman, man, whatever the, whatever the hell you are. It can be made. But in making that person, you have to turn, be able to turn down book deals. You have, to be, you have to be who the fuck you are every day of your life and never care about anybody who gets in your way that says you're not doing something the proper way. I was always afraid of people not wanting to, like when you get beat as bad as I did, I lied all the time. I wanted to be accepted and loved and all that shit that I created about 50 people. Whatever you like, I like. Just if you would be my friend, just be my friend. And that's where we get lost in life. When I post about suffering, this whole new kinder, gentler, soft ass fucking world, they just fucking, oh God, this is horrible. We talking about, no. Suffering, if you know how to do it without making it out to be like, I'm not talking about you have to go through cancer. But I guarantee one thing, man, I bet you're a better motherfucker mentally if you look at it the right way everything i went through in my life every bad fucking thing i went through in my life the two heart surgeries all the name calling being everything i went through if you learn how to flip that motherfucker on top of his head and say hang on hang on there's so much power in this fucking thing and if you look at life as it is a trial ground a testing ground for where you need to belong where you need to go Suffering is a fact of life. If you look at suffering the right way, it's a great tool to callous your mind. If you look at it as suffering, woe is me, this is bullshit, God kicking rocks. If you look at it like, okay, motherfucker, you're testing me now. I get it. Whenever I'm being like depressed, I go through depressed moments, I go, oh, hang on, I'm getting, I'm getting tested. So you have to be aware of all the signals and signs that are, that are being given to you from the world. One of them is if you feel bad, you're being tested. How are you going to perform under that? And that suffering is a part of life. Very needed. That's the only place. Man, I'll never forget when I was younger and I lived in a seven dollar month place and it fucked up. Everything was jacked up. I would, for, I had a pair of jeans and every, I'll never forget this as long as I live. You know, first day of school, people go school shopping, right? Week out, two weeks out, maybe a month out. We didn't have any money to do that. So I had this pair of jeans that the inside of the pocket was green. The inside of the pocket was green. And I wore them almost every fucking day. So what I did for the next year of school was I cut that pocket out so the green would show. So look at a new pair of jeans. All I wanted was money. All I wanted was a nice car, was a nice home. The second I got the fucking money to do it, I realized it's bullshit. That's why I don't own a car. I don't own a place. I don't own shit. You will see me wearing the same fucking shit every fucking day. Nothing. What I realized is all I wanted in my life was look at that fucker in that accountability mirror and be proud of. And everything else went away. 
while you need money to be successful, you need money to live, you need money, money does buy a form of happiness because without it, you're fucking miserable. But once I realized it, it doesn't mean shit, it doesn't mean shit for me. While it helps you, it also hurts you to come from darkness because why it's easy for me to sit back and say, you know what, poopy pants mentality. I'm going to sit back and let the world take care of me now. And we, that's what I'm talking about. Don't play sick too long. While my childhood was so messed up, I played sick way too long and I almost lost tons of opportunities by playing sick. Because it feels good to play sick. My dad beat the fucking shit out of me, man. I, I couldn't read. I can't read. You know, when I was a junior in high school, I couldn't read. If you lived that life, yeah. it feels good for people to, oh, man, you know, that's just David, man. He's just not real smart. And he had a bad life. And you, you get a get out of jail free card. That's nice. It sucks doing what I had to do to get here today. That was not fucking fun. That darkness is not, there's, there's nothing that dark to drive me to the place I had to go to become successful. On the flip side of that, if you come from a silver spoon family, you have to realize that. You have to realize, fuck, there's people out there like David Goggins who had nothing, fucking nothing. And I've had all this opportunity in front of me and I'm a loser. I'm not shit. So what does that say about me? The conversations are very similar. You have all this opportunity and you've gone nowhere with it. I'm at the bottom of the barrel and it could take me a lot longer just to get where you're at. For the, for the starting line, to be fair, there, there's a barrier in your brain. There's a barrier. You got to find out what kind of removes that barrier from your brain. My biggest barrier was my father. And once I removed that barrier, I was free to think. And once I felt good about myself, I was free to put action in. I never felt good about myself. I never felt good about myself. Whenever I would get somewhere, the demon would come back, put me right back in the cage. If you don't go back, like I'm a runner, left knee hurts. A lot of people focus on that fucking left knee. A lot of times it's your fucking right hip, and that's about life. You got to figure out what has messed you up mentally. Go to the source. Go to the origin of the source. When Goggins lived with me, his rule is we had to do something every day that sucked. And anybody, not just Navy SEALs, but anybody that can accomplish anything that is hard. Most of us fail in life because we're afraid of what everyone around you is thinking. We waste so much time on our little gadgets. It's unreal. And we talk about we have no time. Don't hit the snooze button. Why don't you hit the snooze button? Because you wake up already failing. Because motivation is crap. Motivation comes and goes. When you're driven, whatever's in front of you will get destroyed. Life's about self-discipline. It is about self-discipline. We tend to do the things that are easy. It builds no mental toughness. It builds no mental hardening. It builds nothing. They see me now. They see me now as the guy that with his shirt off who can do 4,000, 30 pull-ups in 17 hours, who can run 205 miles in 39 hours, who can do all this crazy shit. But what they don't understand is they don't understand the journey that it took me to get to this point. Never forget to train your fucking mind. In life, a lot of us work our fucking ass off trying to get to a, a better place, a place that makes us feel better about ourselves. Some people want to do ultra races. They're starting to PR during training. Some people want to be a lawyer or a medical student. So they're taking these practice tests and they're fucking crushing the practice test. But guess what happens? Once you get to the actual fucking event, your mind isn't ready. Your mind's not prepared. You've been studying, you've been training, you've been working out, but your mind's not prepared. Story for you. When I was 19 years old, I was going through the Air Force trying to be a pararescueman. I was doing push-ups, sit-ups, swimming. I was doing all this shit, knocking out of the park. One of the best in the class. But the second a fucking op car. If you want to be great, you want to be the best motherfucker ever at what you do, you could be misunderstood by everybody because you're going to be so fucking obsessed and so driven to get there. That's what it takes. It takes every second of your fucking life. Anybody says balance? Yeah, balance is important for a lot of fucking people. It is. But if you want to fucking go to that edge where people do not like you, don't understand you, question everything you fucking do, you, you've arrived. 
when you are misunderstood to the point where fucking people think you're psycho and you're nuts and you're this and that, why are you in the fucking gym at one o'clock in the fucking morning? You just got through doing an op for fucking 13, 14 hours at the ranger school, man, at the gym. What's wrong? You will never understand what is wrong with me. And that's why I'm so fucking glad you don't because I'm in the right fucking spot. When people don't understand you anymore, you're in that spot of obsession and drive where people are like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? I don't want to talk to you, man, because you're not going to get it. You're not the smartest person in school. I had that issue. So my big thing was how I addressed that problem was each thing that is wrong with you has to be a focal point. You can't look at this gigantic list and say, I got to change all this shit. My God, this is crazy. No, you take off the first one. I want to be smarter. For me, that was my thing. I have to, I have to become more intelligent. I have such a severe learning disability, man. I can't retain shit. I had to now get that one thing and then strategize in that one problem. How can I do this? I'm not going to learn like you. I'm not going to learn like anybody else. How am I going to figure this out? So I then figured out, okay, where are my strengths here? Where are my weaknesses in learning? All right, man, how am I going to do this? And I figured out a way to do it by just strategizing. So how I learn to this day If I have a big manual to study, I will have to get a bunch of spiral notebooks from the from the daggone store and each page I have to write each page out maybe 10 times. So there was a thousand page dive manual that I got 18 months before I went to dive school. Most people, I'm not smart. I'm going to go see if I can pass this test. I realized, hang on a second. I'm not smart. How can I get past this? How can I get through this obstacle? I need to get, I need to acquire this book 18 months in advance because it could take me 18 months to write down each page over and over again to then put it to memory. So when the question came up, I had written that question so many times down in that, in, on, you know, on paper that I can recall, okay, page 71 was where I remember seeing this and I can recall it that way. And that's how I did it. So you got to strategize on each problem you have in life. Slowly break down that problem. Don't think about all the problems you have, just one at a time. And before you know it, you fix all these problems, but you cannot focus on all of them, just on the one thing at a time. So today, I decided to try to PR my long run. So the first half of the run, I'm feeling great. My mind is clear, nothing going on. Think about nothing but my, just my running pace, what I'm doing, my breathing, everything like that. Get to mile 15, I turn around, and the demons start to creep in. That inevitable wall is creeping up on me. When you push so hard, something's about to give, and I start to give. My mind started to break down. I started feeling my legs starting to hurt. I started feeling dehydrated. started feeling sorry for myself. started looking around. No one knows I'm fucking out here running. Why don't you go ahead and just stop? Call your girl, have her pick you up. And that's when I feel like a little bitch. And this is when your mind has to fucking change. You got to start thinking, I'm the greediest motherfucker in the world. Your dehydration? Fuck it. Lick your motherfucking lips. Your fucking legs are all sore. You feel like you got shin splints and stress fractures? No, you don't. You got sore fucking legs. Get out of your head and stay hard. Life beat me the fuck up. Bad. I mean, I was uh, knocked out in the 12th round of a, of a 15 round, you know, heavyweight bout. I was knocked out, but what happened was in the 12th round, when the challenger turned his back on me, I was getting the fuck up, and I got up and won the next three rounds and knocked that motherfucker out in the 15th round, so that's my mind about can't hurt me. I was hurt, man. Like, literally, I had to overcome so much those first 26 years of my life, and I still do every day today. You know, it's not over, but the mentality of can't hurt me is just that. No matter what's in front of you, man, you have to face You have to confront, you have to overcome and move forward. So my father, you know, some of the kids that bullied me, my learning disabilities, all these things I went through in life, stuttering, you know, has so many different issues, failing and failing and failing at overcome them or they would have overcame me. People have a a hard thing to understand. I hate to run. And and what makes me so crazy, it doesn't need more, people go, "Well, well, why do you run if you hate it? What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't want to take showers and eat either. I hate that too. 
the, the whole, the, that's a life, man. It wasn't until I changed that mentality that I became somebody. Mm-hmm. I hated going to school. So guess what? I was dumb as shit. But if you can get through to doing things that you hate to do, on the other side is greatness. That's what people understand. By me running, I am callous in my mind. I'm not training for a race. I'm training for life. I'm training for the time when I get that two o'clock in the morning call that my mom is dead or something happens tragic in life. I don't fall apart. I'm training my mind and my body and my spirit so it's all one so I can handle what life is going to throw at me because the life I've lived, it throws a whole bunch at you. And if you're not physically and mentally prepared for that, you're just going to crumble. I was at military free fall school with Morgan Luttrell. Marcus Luttrell, if you guys don't know, was the lone survivor of the guy. He um, was in a bad op, op went bad. He was the only Navy SEAL that lived. Long story short, you got to get the book, read Lone Survivor, great story. Morgan is Marcus Luttrell's twin brother. Mm. And I was there with Marcus. So what happened was myself and Morgan were in free fall school. At the same exact time, Marcus was in the worst incident in still history. So I knew that Marcus might be dead. He wasn't dead, everybody else was dead. So I actually brought Morgan, you know, I actually told Morgan, hey man, your brother was in a bad incident. I don't know if he's alive, I don't know what's going on. Long story short, Marcus is alive and I go on to want to raise money for families. All these guys died, they all had kids. I want to raise money for the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. It's a foundation where 100% tuition goes to these kids to go to college, you know, full tuition, whatever. So I found this great foundation. I'm going to raise money for it. So I said, you know what? I have to Google something that's, that's evil, something very hard. I knew nothing about ultra marathons. I hadn't even run a marathon. I knew nothing about this world. So I Googled the, you know, the top 10 hardest races in the world. And what comes up is a bad water 135. So 135 mile race through Death Valley in the summertime. I thought it was a stage race. I thought it was a race where you run like 20 miles, set up camp, you know, barbecue outside, and then go run some more the next day. So I called the race director up at the race and said, hey, Chris, the name is Chris Costin. I want to do your race. So we had a long conversation. You know, I was, I was much heavier then, and I hadn't put running shoes on over a year. I'm around between 240 to 270. My, my weight has varied a lot through the SEAL teams and out of the sure. SEAL teams, so I was a heavy guy. But the long and short of it all was I hadn't put running shoes on in over a year. I was a big-time power lifter. I lifted weights heavy. That's what I did. I got back home from Iraq, went straight to free fall school, and then this happened. So I called Chris Costman up on a Wednesday. He says, look, man, the only way you can qualify for my race is to run 100 miles at one time in 24 hours or less. There happened to be a race that Saturday, so four days later. And he said, if you qualify by running 100 miles or less in 24 hours, I will consider you my race. I'm going to cut to the chase. I signed up for this race. It's called the San Diego One Day, where you run around a one-mile track for 24 hours to see many miles you can get. My goal was 100 miles. So um, I got to mile 70. And I cleared 70 miles in like 12, 13 hours pretty quickly, but I was done. My feet were broken. I was stress fractures, shin splints, muscles were tearing. I was in bad shape. No water, didn't know what the hell I was doing out there. Had on some tube socks. It was just ridiculous. It was, it was a clown show. So I sat down at mile 70, and at this time I was married. And I, I look at my wife and I was like, um, I'm, I'm messed up bad. So I literally start to turn white. And when a black guy turns white, you're pretty f***ed up. Here I am, I'm all f***ed up in this chair. I'm at mile 70, I think I got 30 miles to go. I'm jacked up. I gotta go to the bathroom, and the, and the bathroom's like 20 feet from me, it's a porta potty. I can't get out of the f***ing chair. So I'm peeing blood down my leg, pooping up my f***ing back, and I got 30 miles to go. And I'm, I can't stand up because my, my blood pressure is all messed up. I've been in three hell weeks, ranger school, overcome so many obstacles in my life. This last 30 miles of this race is when I realized a human being is not so human anymore. We have the ability to go in such a space. If you're willing to suffer, 
and I mean suffer, your brain and your body, once connected together, can do anything. And this 30 miles was the life-changing moment. I was out of it. I was in the worst pain in my entire life. I was, to me, on the brink of death. And I was able to chunk this 30 damn miles into small pieces. I was so driven. And I'm not going to say motivated because motivation is crap. Motivation comes and goes. When you're driven, whatever's in front of you will get destroyed. Mm. So I sat in this chair and I was so driven to succeed in this race. And And at this time... Everybody goes, were you thinking about the guys that died? And I'm not going to lie to you, I wasn't. This became a personal thing. This became me against this race, me against the kids that called me nigger, me against me. It, it, it just became something that I took so, so violently personal. And I broke this thing down into small pieces. I said, okay, I got to get nutrition. I got to be able to stand up before I can get off this curb and get off this chair and be able to go 30 miles. So I went through all these small steps and I, I was able to stand up. And then from standing up, I was literally walking around with my wife at the time. And she goes, you're not going to make the time. She goes, you're, running, I mean, you're, you're walking like 30 some minute miles. I got to mile 81. And the second she said that I'm not going to make the time, I ran the last 19 miles nonstop. And I can show you right now when we get done with this. Matter of fact, I'm going to show you right now. This was years ago. And I had to put compression tape and I had, so this was years ago. I had literally the size of half dollars. I had to get compression tape and I taped up my ankles and I taped up my feet. And that's how I got through that race. So I literally went through all of Bud's, my last SEAL training with stretch fractions and shin splints. And how I did it was I would tape my ankles all the way up to my calf every morning. So for the first hour, the pain was excruciating. But what happened is my feet would go numb. And I did that every single day for six months. That's how I got through my third hell week because I was so broken from the first two that the commander said, hey, the CEO said, this is your last time we're sending you through. So that's how I got the idea to do that. So with the right, and, and people may listen to this and say, this guy is sadistic, he's crazy, he's... No, if you know how I came up, you realize I was just a scared kid that found drive and passion to be something much better than what he thought he was. That's all it is. Self-talk and visualization are the two keys to my success. I believed for that last time, 19 miles, I was indestructible because I took myself in that chair, crapping up my back, peeing blood down my leg, shin splint stress fractures, I use all that for motivation versus negativity. I use it for motivation. I, I, I said to myself, who on this earth would still be going right now? You are. You are. You got to be the hardest on the planet. Is it true? I don't give a f- At that time, it got me to the finish line of that f- race. I believed it. I believe it today. I believed it enough to where my body said, he's not going to stop. And that's, I took all the negative things. I need to go to the hospital, this and that. And I used it all. Who the hell could even get out of that chair? You did. Who the hell would even think about taping stretch fractures up? You did. All those things I used for motivation. This voice in my head guided me to the spot where I'm at today. And if you don't believe that you're here for a reason, your life will seriously hurt. And I start looking at my life and all the shit I went through as God put me, some God, whatever you believe in, put me here to go through this. And now I see all the hundreds of thousands of lives I'm changing by the hell I went through. There's a lot of power in that. So my purpose as I started going through this journey, instead of looking at like, woe is me, God, man, why, why the fuck, man, why, why? I started looking at it as, it's the perfect training ground. You knew exactly what you were doing. You knew exactly what the fuck you were doing, obviously. You put me in every situation possible to tell a story that needed to be told. I mean, it was a very scary, scary road. A guy who was afraid of a lot of things to then find power in fear, to find power in overcoming fear, and to get to where I'm at today where 
there's very few things that I'm really afraid of because I know how to control it. I know how to manage it. I know how to work it to my advantage now. It's, it's, it's something else, man. So I really challenge people to really do a live autopsy on your brain. And the reason why I talk about my childhood so much in this, because I don't want you to put a title on me. Because once you title me as a freak, you now put yourself in a position where you can be very comfortable in saying, it's just not possible for me. The thing that makes me so pissed off in this world, man, the one thing that only thing that gets me mad nowadays is that so many people die with untapped potential because they think that someone else is fucking better than them. And they were born, you know, not with the greatest tools. You don't need shit. You need the ability to fucking grind your ass into a fine fucking powder. And when you're in that fine powder, find a way to build that motherfucker back up repeatedly. And it's possible. You were bullied. Do you remember how many nights you spent by yourself in your fucking head? Thinking about what kind of piece of shit you were? And how miserable that fucking was? That's exactly my drive. I know that there's not just me and you. There's millions and millions, especially nowadays, with all this fucking pressure, man. You, 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 can, you can now bully a motherfucker on your phone. You, you, know, but, you know, back in our day, it was face to face. You can do everything over your phone. The, the, the pressures of trying to keep up with everything is at an all-time high. And our mindsets are at an all-time low. We are the weakest we've been mentally ever since, since the beginning of time. And it's even harder. So it's harder with a weaker mind. So all I want to do, my, my whole drive is about, I have a really good way of visualizing people suffering. Because a lot of people do it. We have two sides of us. We have one side that is that happy-go-lucky side that nothing's wrong and yeah. everything is good. But we have that side at home where no one's around that's depressed and miserable and we're not good enough. And whatever happened to you is real. So that's my drive. I want to make sure that I give people as much power as I can so when they get up every fucking morning, they know that, hey, I have the ability to not only survive in this world but thrive in this world just by the mere fact of hearing about my story. We all look for toughness. We all want it. But we look for it in a comfortable environment. You will not find toughness in a comfortable environment. You want people who are honest with you who are going to tell you what is honest. Honest and truthful people. The most important conversation you'll ever have is the one you have with yourself. You wake up with it. You walk around with it. Eventually, you'll act on it. And my self-talk was the most disgusting self-talk of all time. You got to start diving into those things that you are afraid of. You don't gain confidence by going to the spot that makes you feel good. It's going to be a false reality. But you overcome those fears, guess what happens? The whole world, you unlock this door and everything opens back up again. I made this person. I made this person by diving in to the insecurities that life gave me. What if? A lot of times I'll be in a 200 mile run or something like that and I'm all jacked up. Body's broken, mind's broken, spirit's broken. I start to say, what if I can pull this off? When I first walked into the Navy SEAL recruiter's office, he looked at me and said, there's only been 35 African Americans in 70 years make it through. You know what I said to myself? What if I can be the 36th? It's the what if I can pull off a miracle? What if I can become someone that no one thinks I can be? And just, that, just me talking about that, I have the hair going up on my arms. So many people, before I give them a workout plan, they're talking about recovery. Everybody, everybody that hears me speak, they want to go straight to recovery. Workout first. We are always looking for, like whenever I talk to people, people take my words and they put it in a way to where they want to feel comfortable. This guy, you know, they, they, they want to put you in a box. They want to put a title on you. No, you're putting a title on me to make yourself feel better about yourself. If you read this book of mine and you see where I came from, I made this person. I made this person by diving in to the insecurities that life gave me. Because now they're yours. They're yours to own. If you're not smart, call yourself dumb. It's okay, because you are. But take that now as you're putting yourself down. If you're fat, call yourself fat. I used to be 300 pounds. 
we, we want to talk so soft to ourselves. We're looking for that recovery day. And that recovery day is everything in your life. Everything in your life is a recovery day. We're looking for it. It's not coming. It's not coming. Get over that recovery day. And that's the mentality I took with me. And what happened through that process was all the frivolous things of life started to float away. I used to tell people lies so they would like me because I was so insecure. When you start to build yourself up and start to have the one thing that we don't have is confidence. Real, authentic confidence from hard work. You now know. I walk in a room now and I know the hours and years and decades I put in the David Goggins. That's something, it's not on the wall. It's not a trophy on the wall. It's not a medal on your neck. It is actually a feeling in your heart. I don't care how you perceive David Goggins because through my journey, I figured out the one piece I was missing. I thought it was cars. I thought it was women. I thought it was everything. The one piece I was missing was me having the courage to face myself. And once you do that on a daily basis, it's not about the running. Work, people are going to be, you about working out. Where I got my work ethic from was the hours I had to spend learning this. When you sit down and you're not smart, and you have a disability, and you still want to be at the top of your class, I didn't want to just get by. When I realized that I can learn through hard work, and I can beat the valedictorian in school, but I got put in 10 hours more a day than he does. You know what kind of strength comes from that? When you're sitting down, that guy that, that valedictorian studied for an hour, and you know I caught you. I caught you, and I am dumb, but I have the work ethic to catch you. That's where David Gaga's got really invented. It's that, having a discipline every day to say, for me to learn this one math problem, it's gonna take me 10 hours. And that's where it, and you realize through hard work, you can do, you can outwork anybody, no matter how badass they are. But that's the part people don't want to dive into. Some people didn't understand when I say I'm training for life. 2020 was the perfect example of that. A lot of people lost jobs, lost businesses, lost family members. A lot of folks spent a lot of time in the hospital on ventilators. That should have caused a lot of demons in your brain. Folks see how much that work out. And they think I'm running from demons. It's not demons, it's discipline. And I'm a disciple of discipline. You can outrun your demons. They'll always find you. Only way to beat them mother is look at them eye to eye and make them your bitch. Mindset's the only thing that gets you through hard times. So think about this. I put everything on David Goggins to be a Navy SEAL. It's like going to the crap table with, with your last thousand dollars. And you say, you know what? I'm going to put everything on this fucking on, on black. And hopefully I win. If not, I'm broke. I put my whole life, a guy that was scared of the water, a guy that could taught himself how to read and write, on being one of the hardest motherfuckers on the planet. Think about that shit. A guy that came from nothing. I put my whole life, and I'm going to go out here and put everything on David Goggins to be a Navy SEAL. Not to go be a, you know, Boy Scout or some A Navy SEAL. And I, and I, I, I look at that, and... I did all this shit just to get the opportunity to succeed. That's what that's what people don't understand, man. If people see the, the the end result, I remember that guy saying, "My God, man, I can't believe what I've just done. I put everything, ruin relationships, ruin this, ruin that, put everything on. In fact, I have to become someone in this world, or I'm no good for anybody." It comes from a disgusting place of not being fulfilled in your life of afraid of dying having never accomplished anything that's a fear that some people run away from that people don't want to face when you have a real fear of dying and being just another person that i live to pay the bills i made a thousand dollars a month this is my life i spray for cockroaches man if if that makes you feel good that's great it didn't make me feel good I wanted to the first time in my life, after 26 years, it was 24, 25, wherever I was, I wanted to feel good about myself. Think about how many years, months, 
hours, seconds, days, all that shit. You have wasted all people who suck the fucking life out of you. Today's a good day for you to go through and can those mother Shit can those mother to only call you when they need something. Shit can those mother can't get over shit. Who continue to bring up from the past. Who can't move forward. Life is short. Life is precious. Spend that time with the people you love. The people you want to give that time to. Real friends, real family. Everybody else. And they're sucking up the air you breathe. You need that motherfucker to be hard. Stay hard. Why is the truth so important? You know what? Because, first of all, it does set you free mentally. And it gives you a starting point. You have to have the truth to have a starting point. So when you, like, if, if I'm lying to you about who I am, or I'm lying to you about whatever, there's no starting point. There's a false reality. You have to create the real reality. So that's what I call my accountability mirror in my book. That's the real reality. Where the f am I going to start from? So for me, I was lying to this, lying about that. So I had no starting point. Once you come face to face with who you are, you have a starting point. All right, I'm not real smart. I have no courage. I have no self-esteem. I have no nothing, nothing. That's my starting point. Now we can move from there. But if I tell myself I'm strong, I have courage, I'm smart, and all these are lies, you continuously push that starting point backwards. So that starting point is the truth. The no bullshit truth that only you can tell yourself. So it's the starting point. The truth is the starting point. Especially nowadays in this society, we like to surround ourselves. It makes us feel so good. Those people who say, it's okay. It's okay. It's not okay. It isn't okay, man. And I, and I get it. Society's changing. And we love to feel wanted and loved. Trust me. That's all important. It right. is. But you have to have the truth from people. Hey, you're not working your butt off hard enough. You're not trying hard enough. We all think we're trying hard. But what are you gauging that off of? Are you gauging off of, like, I talked to this one kid the other day. College is kicking my ass. I said, what are you gauging that off of? I go, are you trying? He goes, yeah, I'm trying my ass off. I'm studying hard. I go, what are you gauging trying hard off of? Well, in high school, I didn't have to try at all. And I made great grades. In college, I'm trying hard. You're trying hard compared to what you did in high school, which was it came easy to you. So your reality is something that you created off of something easy. So you trying hard is two hours of studying. I'm going to tell you a difference in trying hard and trying hard. Trying hard is something in your mind just doesn't stop. We, we, we know two hours isn't enough. So it's all about, you know, reality and what you're basing things off of. When I was 297 pounds and I was fat as hell trying to be a Navy SEAL, the scariest thing in the world to me, even to this day, was that that could have been the rest of my life. I thought then I was trying hard. That's the scariest thing in the world. I thought then, 297 pound, working for Ecolab, spraying for cockroaches, making a thousand dollars a month. I thought that was me at my 100% potential. Come to find out, a few years later, I wasn't anywhere near that. 106 pounds less, graduate Navy SEAL training, went on to do all these other things. Looking back on that, that was me trying hard. That's why people gotta understand what is in us we have no idea until we start trying hard. And I mean really trying hard where you're obsessed with, hey, this is my new norm. My new norm is that, wow, this isn't always fun. It's not always meant to be fun. And that's when you know you're trying hard. When I was in Ranger school, my squad got spot checked. The Ranger instructor was looking for three items. One of my guys didn't have the items. So the whole squad got smoked. The R.I. was sitting there smoking us. And the more he smoked us, the more my squad looked around looking for someone to motivate him. The range instructor shouted out, I'm going to bury you. So I saw that my squad needed some extra motivation. So I said, ain't no grave that can hold us down, mother. 
Ain't no grave that can hold us down. Right now in life, your family is looking for that one guy right now. They're looking for that one guy who's strong, who's that pillar for the family in hard times. Make sure they look around. They look around and find you. These are the times right now for you to step up. Be that guy that can take anything. Stay hard. This is the world that is in front of me. And what most people do is they see this world and they look at it as an excuse to get out of it. I started looking at it as this is the ultimate training ground for the rest of my life. I have all these valuable lessons because if you look out in the world right now today, it's not a nice place, but I'm very prepared for it. I'm prepared for all the failure coming my way. I'm prepared for everything my way. And that's the biggest lesson that she taught me by not teaching me, mm. by never saying it's going to be okay. Matter of fact, she told me the exact opposite. Life sucks. That's what she knew. And it was the truth. And so I started at that point in my life, I have a lot more failures as you see in that book, but I started down the road of, instead of the path of least resistance, I started choosing the path of most resistance to prepare myself for the journey that was coming my way. We live in a box and we don't want to go outside that box at all, ever. Outside that box is all these possibilities of life. What we do is we shackle our mind. We are a prisoner in our own mind that this is all I can do. This is all I'm good at. And we, we, we take away the possibilities of you could be this, you could be that, you could be all these things. Mm -hmm. And I never thought at 300 pounds I could be Navy SEAL. So if my mind was shackled, there'd be no book, there'd be nothing. So what people understand is that they live for themselves, not knowing that you have the power within yourself to change millions of lives by facing life, by facing yourself. And through that, I, I would die never knowing that I had the power to change millions of lives. I got feed myself. And every foot strike that hits the pavement, that's how I feed myself. Motherfucker, look for inspiration. Inspiration is found in every footstep you take. Every grasp of that iron bar. All that shit, all the miles in the pool. Inspiration is found in suffering. So right now, this is my greatest recovery. As I recover, I find inspiration. Stay hard. I have the ability to see the end before the beginning even begins. And what that means is I know that to get to the very end, I can see it right now. So before I went to Bud's and I was losing all this weight, I saw myself walking across the stage at 191 pounds. That's what I had to get to, to, to get into the door. I saw myself six months, a year later, whatever it's going to take me to do it. I saw myself walking across that stage, getting that certificate of graduation from Bud's. And I was able to be there at 300 pounds. And that feeling that I was nowhere near that feeling, I was able to put myself there a million times every day. And that feeling of like, my God, that is going to feel amazing. That's what made me suffer. That's what allowed the pain to be real and say, this is worth it. I want to feel for this next 18 months. It took me 18 months to finally become a Navy student, to finally you know, just get through butts. 18 months. It's six months. It took me 18. That's what woke me up every morning was I'm going to put myself through this much pain and suffering for a few seconds. That's all it is. A few seconds of joy. And so fucking worth it, man. That's what people don't get. So I'm able to put myself at the finish line, even though I have no finish line, but at the finish line of an event before I even start the mother and say, how are you going to feel at the end of this? Visualizing is, is my biggest tool of life. That's why I, I, I've been able to put myself in cold water, put myself in a hundred mile race millions of times before I've done it. And I've been able to go through the race and see how I'm going to feel at mile 50. Almost to the, almost to the exact, exact feeling. And that's the one thing I practice and practice and practice and practice overnight. But also the most important thing is I, I, I practice that feeling of accomplishment that I'm going to have and it's all said and done with. Get a lot of questions. People asking me for help. So I ask them, what have you done to help yourself? Most of them say, I've been working hard. 
I'm all about being your own hero. But I'm not about kissing your ass. In life, a lot of us believe that we're working much harder than we actually are. We think if we got up early for four days, we burned something. You gotta drop your entitled mindset. It's dead weight. We believe you work harder than we actually have. Trust me, most of us haven't. The one thing in life you gotta realize is this. Learn to help yourself. Don't count on other people to help you. Stay hard. Yeah. Because I realized once I was talking to myself the right way and all this shit wasn't in my mind, wow. I went from this piece of kid who thought he was dumb, not successful, insecure, who stuttered when I first saw somebody, to a person who can now do all these things just because I now control my own mind. Mm. And I don't care. When you get to the point where you really and don't care, you become very, very dangerous. Mm. I'm not saying don't care like, I don't care if I do that. No, when you don't care about other people and how they view you, mm. about how you walk, how you talk, how you dress, where you want to go with your life. You know, growing up, I didn't want to tell anybody I wanted to be in the military. Because why? Some of my black friends, I was afraid of what they think. Mm. Why do you want to join the fucking military, man? Why do you want to do that shit? Mm. I was afraid of what other people thought about me. So now, when I go in the military, I know you want to fucking join the military. Yeah, I ain't tell you because I'm afraid of what you thought. Once again, man, you're allowing other people to shackle your mind. It's the, it's, the, it's the worst thing in the world. Let's say, for instance, we have a family. Let's say we're all a big family here. And every morning I'm getting up training for a 200 mile run. And you see me get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. And all you are sleeping. And by the time I get done running my 30, you come, I come home just getting up. How are you going to feel about yourself? A lot of our family members, a lot of our friends, they're mediocre. There's always those couple of guys who are uncommon, who want to be better. But you make that mediocre mother feel like Whether it's your mom, your dad, whoever. You make them feel horrible. I've been there. I'm speaking from experience. You get somebody around you man, who's trying to be better and you don't have the drive that they have. It's a constant reminder of how you are. You have to know that that's what it is. Anybody in your course not saying, man, get after it, brother. I'm so proud of you. They have a problem with themselves. Because all you're trying to do is achieve more. If that's a problem for somebody, you have to look at them and say, man, you really have a fucking problem with yourself, huh? Most of this generation quits the second they get talked to. You did this wrong, you did this wrong, or, or they get yelled at. It's so easy to be great nowadays, because everybody else is, most people are, are weak. This is a softened generation, so if you have any mental toughness, any, any ability, if you have any fraction of self-discipline, the ability to not want to do it, but still do it. We're all, we, we are all great. No matter if, if you think you're dumb, no matter if you think you're fat, no matter if you are fat, no matter if you've been bullied, or no matter if you just got back from Iraq or Afghanistan and you have no legs or your arms or whatever, man, we all have greatness. It just, you got to find the courage. You got to find the courage to put your Bose headphones on and silence the noise out of this world and to find it. And to find it because it's out there, but it's going to take hard work, courage, self-discipline. It's going to take all the non-cognitive skills. The, all the non-cognitive skills to be great. You know, smart is good, all this stuff is good. That's all cognitive. It's the non-cognitive skills that sets you apart from everybody else. And, and that's what it's all about. I'm not the smartest kid in the world. Okay. Instead of somebody saying, oh no, you're smart. No, no, don't say that to yourself. I said to myself, no, I'm a dumb mother. Okay, roger that. How do you get smarter? Educate yourself. So the things that we run from, we run from the truth. We're running from the truth, man. So the only way I became successful was going towards the truth. As painful and as brutal as it is, it changed me. Mm. It, it allowed me to become, in my own right, who I am today. My biggest advice to give everybody in the world is, like I say, we live in an external world. Everything is, is you got to see it, touch it, it's, it's, it's external. If you can, for the rest of your life, live inside of yourself, 
Stop listening to people who are calling you fat, gay, transsexual, nigger, everything that is makes no sense. All these insecure people putting their insecurities on you, you got to flush it out. You got to just be whoever the hell God or whatever the hell you believe in. If you believe in nothing but yourself, I don't care what it is. You got to take everything and throw it away. You have to believe in one thing and that is yourself. And, and I'm not saying don't believe in God or what you believe in, but right now for you to find greatness in yourself, you're not going to find it by looking in a book or by even hearing me. I may give you the spark, but you've got to go inside yourself to find it. And that means you got to be quiet. Shut the fuck up, go in a room, stop talking, search your soul, search your mind, search your abilities and you'll find it. But if you're not looking for it, you won't find it. So you got to go start your journey. And the journey starts with you finding, why the hell am I here on this planet Earth? Why am I here? And if you don't know that, you will live the rest of your life searching, always asking the question, why? Tighten up, people. It's okay. Trust me. It's okay. You might be called nigger one day. It's okay. You might be called some Jewish word or some faggot or gay word. It's okay. Let them call you that. What are you going to do now? They don't own your life. How are you going to control that now? How are you going to flip it upside down and say, Roger that, now I'm going to harness this shit and you'll read about me years from now? How? That's the question. How are you going to do that? Thicken your skin. Become more of a human being. Don't be afraid of the reflection in the mirror because that's all you can be afraid of. Once you overcome the reflection in the mirror, you've done it. So I get an email the other day. This young man wants to be a ranger. But he's afraid to go to ranger school. Not because how hard the training is, but because he's afraid if he fails, what people are going to say by judging him. One thing in life, this applies to everything in life. Anytime you move from being normal to trying to be exceptional, people aren't going to like that shit. Those normal people, it makes them feel like shit, so they're going to judge you. And nowadays, it's very easy to be a fucking coward. Why? We got Instagram and shit. Most folks don't tell you to your face. They go online. They post about like cowards. Don't let cowards get in your fucking head. And last thing, make sure you do you. Stay hard. What brings me joy and happiness is knowing how beautiful the mind is. And I'm one of the few people that didn't read about it didn't experience it through some, some drug. I got to experience the beauty of true willpower. True, I'm gonna fail, I'm gonna fail, I'm gonna fail, I'm gonna fail, and I will succeed. Just me talking about that gives me a feeling, I know what I did, and I don't need to travel somewhere or to have this or have that. I have it all here in my mind. The beauty is remembering this young, dumb, what people call nigger is now where I'm at today. And that is when you finally get to that point for me, it's forever lasting peace. I, do need, I, I could die right now on this show and I'll be happy, man. So that's my happiness is, is, is my reflection on the suffering of my journey, knowing I never quit, nor was I guided by anybody on this earth. I was guided by something much more powerful and I listened and I chose the path of most resistance. Talent not required. I'm pulling up a lot of the, the uh, dark side of me, but I'm also looking at the guys to my left and to my right, realizing that um, we're here together, man. And I have, to, uh, I have to be strong for them and they gotta be strong for me. A lot of people, either you like me or you don't, even in the SEAL teams, but when you get to that door or you get on that mission or you get on that op, all that shit's out the door, man. You know, you, you do it honestly. I mean, people say all the time in these movies and shit, you, you, you really out there fighting for that guy beside you. And you can't be a coward. Because you know what? And this is how I look at everything I do now in life, and this sums it up. I hated jumping out of airplanes. I hated shooting guns. I hated the job as a Navy SEAL. But I did it 
because I wanted to change myself. Mm. Everything I do, I'm not really comfortable doing. But if you choose to go that route, to go be a Navy SEAL, you might as well go be the hardest mother in the world. Because if you're choosing to do something, you have two routes. You can go there and be a little, a little weak person mm. and get through barely, and that's your reputation. Or you can go through the hardest guy you can possibly be, and that's your reputation. So my whole thing is, if you're going to choose to open that fucking door in Iraq or Afghanistan, open the mother and go in hard. Because they're going to remember you by slowly opening it and peeking in. So if you're going to open it and you made the mind to open it, don't crack it open. Open the fucking door and go in. That's with life. If you're choosing to do, if you're choosing to do something, attack it. Because they're going to remember you as not attacking it. So I want to be remembered. You can hate me, but one thing you can't say about me, I didn't attack it. So that's the mentality you have. If you're going to do something, you might as well attack it because you can do it anyway. So the accountability mirror is something that I kind of came up with in high school. Like I said, I started shaving my head when I was 16. And I got caught up in trying to impress so many people because no one liked me. So I developed so many different identities. Let me sag my pants. You know, let me, okay, let me pull my pants up. Let me, let me talk this way or act this way or be this way or, or whatever the hell it may be. God, dog, there's so many different things I did to try to fit in with so many different groups that when you look in the mirror, that's the one person you can't lie to. So every morning I would shave my head thinking, God, I will reflect back on some of the lies I may have told somebody or some of the ways I acted that I didn't feel comfortable doing. And I did it to impress other normal people. The key word there is normal, everyday people. I was trying to make other people like me. How pathetic is that? So I, th this mirror would always tell me, my, 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 my reflection would say, God, you are a pathetic man. How does that feel every day to be this way? So I would just start having myself accountable. How, how did I attack today? How did I attack yesterday? And if I didn't do something I was proud of, I write down a sticky note and I would fix it. The reason why we go back to old habits is because our goals are too lofty. We're not achieving our goals fast enough. So what happens is, you know what? Oh man, I'm, we're very impatient nowadays. For me, it was good. I didn't have a phone. I was, I, was, I was out of this world by myself. It was a race against David Goggins. It wasn't a race against, God, I want to look good for this person or that person. It was me. I got to change myself. So for me, if I lost five pounds in a week, I got a feeling, I allowed myself to feel proud of that. I didn't look at, I got to lose 106 pounds. I'm like, man, I went from 297, now I'm 292. In one week, man, I'm, I'm killing it. We don't, we're not proud of ourselves for the small accomplishments. What we need is we need this monstrosity of the thing to happen and say, ah, I did it. Nah, there's a process that you have to go through and patience is the process. And if we don't have patience after a week, I haven't lost 30 pounds and I'm done. I'm over it. So that's why I found out with people, man, they're not patient enough to realize and to enjoy the moment, not live in it, just enjoy it. There's no finish line in life, but enjoy that moment. Roger that, man, I lost five. Let me go 10 next week. So that's the whole thing about it. That's how people lose it. Our mind wants to protect us. The mind is like, honestly, it has a tactical advantage over us. It knows our deepest, darkest fears or insecurities. It knows where we start to feel, uh, we start getting that doubt creeping. It says, hey man, you know what, man? Maybe this isn't good. Let's go back home to the wife. Let's go back home to the kids. This is not comfortable. So in that moment, the mind directs us. It's a protective mechanism. It saves us for doing bodily harm or, or, it really saves us from discovering that the mind's like, I want to be in charge of you. I don't want you to be in charge of me. So it tells you, let's just stop right here. 
But once you start breaking through that barrier and start breaking down that governor, that governor that you've put in your mind, because we forget we are in control of our mind. We believe it's the other way around. No, we put in our minds what we should do. But we believe our mind is telling us, it's, it's giving us all this feedback. We have to reprogram it and tell us, no, 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 we're good. We're good. We got it's, This sucks, but it's okay. A lot of us don't know of a whole other world that exists. It's on the other side of suffering. Once you break these barriers that you have made for yourself, like the mind is the most powerful thing in the world. It is so amazing that I used to be a 300 pound guy and I thought that was it. Could barely read, could do anything. And now, that what was inside that person was this guy that's in front of you today. That's how scary the mind is. And that's what I started realizing through this journey is that once I got a taste of, wow, man, I haven't even cracked. I haven't even begun to crack what the mind is capable of. And what I started realizing is on the other end of suffering, that's the real growth of life. Because you realize how the mind processes shit. And I talk about another thing called theory and practice. A lot of people are theorists. They, these smart guys that read these fucking books and shit, man, and they sit down and they tell you what the mind is supposed to do. And a lot of us listen to that shit. It becomes like, this is it, man. This, this old man who has been studying the mind forever, this is the cap that we have. By being a practitioner, I went out and realized a lot of these guys are so wrong, man. The mind has capabilities that are so unknown. I found that through suffering. And there's a whole other world on the other end of that. I was so afraid of myself that I had to figure out I became a master of my mind. People, when you're afraid of something, you have to master it. That's how you start to overcome it. So what I realized, when I get to that point where I want to quit everybody, they get to the point where they want to quit. This is what happens. The mind tells you, Let's go home. Let's take a warm shower. Let's get some food. This is not right. This is that. If you cannot answer the questions at that moment, because your mind's going to start giving you all these questions, all these questions. And if you can't answer them, you're going to quit. What I realized when I was going through Bud's Ranger School, all this 100 mile race, 200 mile races, pull up records, my mind would come creeping in. Like when I was doing 4,030 pull ups at, at, at 2,000 pull-ups and my hands were ripped open. My mind said, look, brother, we've done all these other things. You've proven yourself. You're good. If I didn't have the answer to respond to my mind and say, why I'm here, why I'm... always lose that fight you have to have the response to what your mind is going to tell you and another thing about that is self-talk a lot of people have like these big four on mental toughness all that shit is crap about self-talk visualization it's true but the thing about self-talk and all these things they ask me what do you think about when you're on mile 100 of a 205 mile run what are you thinking about when you realize you've run for 24 hours and you have 24 more hours to run, and you have another 105 miles, what goes through your mind? What do you say to yourself? I wanna know. A lot of people think self-talk works, it does, but it doesn't work without the suffering before your mind starts saying we need self-talk. 
So what I tell myself is I go back to the months and years of preparation to get to that day. And I'm telling myself, the 3.30 in the morning, and I'm looking at my shoes, and I don't want to go out there and run 30 miles. I have to in that second, in that moment of this self-talk, my mind saying, you got to find more, you got to find more. I once again calm down, go back into my mind, in my cookie jar, I call it, and I have to reflect back on the shit I did to get here. And that becomes my self-talk. Self-talk does not work unless it is real. Most of us lie to ourselves in the self-talk. It doesn't work. It has to be real. It has to be something that you've done to make it really work. If you walk into any kind of event, whether it be physical or mental, if you walk in with already putting that block on your mind, if, man, this ain't going to happen, People go, how did you run 135 miles to death valley? And how did you run 100 miles with no training? Because I went into it not thinking, I can't do this, man. I went into it with a strategy. I had an open-mindedness. So until your mind is open to the possibilities that I can do this, you would never be able to do it. Once the mind starts to believe it can be achieved, it then, only then, does it start to break down tactically how we can do this. Until then, you're gonna always lose. What do you want in your life? We have so much influence coming at us that we are so lost. We don't know what we wanna do because we don't spend enough time with ourselves. You have to learn to shut off a phone, shut off a computer, shut off a TV, and it's okay to sit in a room by yourself in a chair and just think about you where I want to be, where, where do I see myself tomorrow, the next year, the next year from that. And it takes a lot of self-discipline to be able to do that nowadays because you want to be so, so attached to everything. You want to be so caught up with the world. The world's moving too fast. The world's moving so fast that you're trying to keep up to the point where you lose yourself in the world. So you have to take that time and go to that dark place in your mind and discover who you are.